You're listening to Troubled Minds Radio Network on KUAP Digital Broadcasting, where the strange is just another day at the office and the unexplained is our playground. It's time to talk about a very serious matter. Are you prepared for an alien invasion? It may seem like something out of a sci-fi movie, but the threat may be very real. And that's why the Galactic Alliance is here to help. With our state-of-the-art technology and top-of-the-line defense systems, we're ready to take on any extraterrestrial threat that comes our way. But we can't do it alone. We need your help, citizens of the galaxy. So if you see something suspicious, say something. Report any strange activity to your local Galactic Alliance outpost immediately. And if you want to be extra prepared, sign up for our alien defense training program. Learn how to use a laser blaster, navigate through space, and communicate with alien species. Who knows? You might even make some new alien friends along the way. So remember, stay vigilant, stay prepared, and together we can keep our galaxy safe. A public service announcement from the Galactic Alliance. I'll be right there. Don't move. A mad world where information can be trusted. Not very hard, is it? News service says one thing. Website says another. Society starts to fray. All we can turn to are the people we care about. What if those people were who we thought they were? What if the ones closest to us, the ones we've trusted our whole lives, were someone else entirely? What if they weren't even human? Respectfully? What exactly are you talking about? Chaos. And that's only the beginning. Five global terrorist strikes within the past year, each one claimed by a different group. Business as usual. That's precisely what they want you to think. Argentina tax Colombia. Colombia tax the Philippines. A vile chain reaction consuming the globe. Do you realize the entire world is war? The atmosphere has been tense. There is an architect to that tension. These attacks are escalating. If they hit the soil of a major power, ugh. Do you, you think the same people are behind all of this? Not people. Scrubs. Oh, come on, Ross. You know the story. This didn't start yesterday. It started 30 years ago when the Scrubs found Earth. Carol Danvers and Nick Fury promised to find them a new planet. Now, now they don't want just any planet. They want ours. But can't you see it? All these groups, they're the same. The trolls could be anybody, anywhere, anytime. And there's only a tiny handful known to live on Earth. That's barely enough to, to what? You have no goddamn idea what you're talking about. There are thousands of them, tens of thousands, and you would never know. Okay, Prescott, let's play a little game of forest for the trees, shall we? Yes, scrolls can shapeshift. Yes, they're looking for a new home. But as you say, the only scroll contact is being fury. That means there are allies. There are words, fury. All these other attacks, they can mean nothing compared to this. This is the one. That sets the world on fire.
Oh, no, I forgot to I'll start over. I'm having a few technical issues today. PC crashed, mute to myself and stuff. All right, let's start over then. So today, Examines Podcast, me, host Liam Martin. You can find us on Spotify, uh, all your regular podcasting platforms, usually live in streaming live on Rumble, YouTube, X, and Twitch. And yeah, you can find us on the Trouble Minds Radio Network, KUAP Digital Broadcasting. And today we're going to have a look at godlike powers that are available now. So looking at the ancient gods, and uh, as Officer e. Clark once said, uh, it's, funny, it's Officer e. Clark that was quoted as saying, any sufficiently advanced enough technology is indistinguishable from magic. So technological uh, prowess and human ingenuity has brought us to be able to have some of these godlike powers. So I thought I'll have a bit of a comparison show today and have a look at some of these ancient tales of gods and what or what powers that they had and then how we've got them now and how they're advancing and getting really we're getting some serious godlike powers so today we shall step into the realm where ancient myths and the cutting edge technologies converge in the latest podcast episode on the exominds podcast so today we're going to be bridging ancient powers and modern wonders so join us as we embark on a captivating journey exploring the parallels between legendary godly abilities and the incredible advancements that technology is unlocking today from icarus flight to hermes communication prowess will draw connections between mythical tales and contemporary technologies like drones brain computer interfaces and more discover how the god powers find echoes in our digital age where science and innovation are pushing the boundaries of what humanity can achieve so we'll delve into this podcast episode and unravel all the threads connecting Apollo's healing touch to modern medical marvels and explore the invisibility realm akin to the Hades helmet and through the lens and stealth technology. So join us as we're contemplating the, the might of Hercules in our time, but not in the form of a demigod, but with wearable exoskeletons empowering humans to have superhuman strength and there's more and there's an extra caveat with that so we'll navigate through this fusion of ancient narratives and futuristic wonders and we'll also delve into the ethical considerations surrounding these advancements exploring the impact on society and pondering the responsibilities that come with playing with the powers once reserved for the gods so tune in with your host Liam martin and the examines podcast and let your imagination soar as we'll, we'll bridge the gap between the divine, the digital, weaving the tapestry of wonder that spans across centuries and civilizations. So, not just a podcast, but of course it's a journey, a journey into innovation in this one, and uh, through the mythical landscapes with the modern meets the symphony of the awe-inspiring tales. So, yes, the gods are known. See, this is the, the premise for this, that the gods are known for these amazing abilities. So today, Oh, we've got someone in the chat. I didn't even tell anyone about the show today. Is it? Oh, it's Daryl. Hi. Glad you could make it. Hi, Daryl. Yeah, I had, my PC crashed before the show, so I started a bit late, and then and then the OBS thing won't work, and then the sound won't come on. I was like, oh, no, I was having one of them days today. But yes. Um, yeah, well, we seem to be on then. Sam seems to be going through, so we'll we'll look at this. Then we'll look at the ancient godlike abilities and some of the some of the technologies coming today. So what we're covering today's show is the the mind, body, and beyond gene splicing. Um, we'll be looking at someone called Ventor, who's got this amazing technique. We'll be looking at dreads, and we'll be looking at DNA encryption. Find the energy. Let's go. Yes, Dark Devious, find the energy. I had to muster some energy today, I told you, to get this show, <laughs> to get this show together. Because, uh, yeah, anyway, lots of technical issues and problems today. But we got through it, and we're here. We're, we're here. And we've, and we've got two people in the chat, which is amazing, considering I hardly remembered to tell people, and I've only just posted it, and then in two places, and yet we've got two got two listeners there so i can't really complain <laughs> okay so let's get on with the show then right let's look at this and so gods of all yeah we're gonna look at the mind body connection i'm gonna go beyond that gene splicing and look at uh, things called dreads venter dna encryption and k 
to start off with then let's go for the obvious first one and um, there's a little caveat with this as well so first then let's consider the power of flight because that's something that man's often looked up to the skies and saw the birds and of course power of flight we've done that with the Wright brothers a bit back you know but in ancient Greek mythology, Icarus used wings made of feathers and wax to escape from imprisonment. But today, we've long done been doing flying and craft. We're all right to talk about UFOs now. And drones, you know, the advent of drones makes us like, it's literally child's play these days to have flying things. So, you know, we've got the flying thing, but now we're getting to the point where drones today are equipped with advanced aerial technology as well. So that allow, allows us to soar through the skies, survey the landscapes, capture breathtaking views, you know, and get like kind of selfie shots and stuff from all kinds of places these days. Right? People take them out of planes and stuff, don't they? Take selfies in the planes or whatever. But but yeah, so so that's it's easy, like I say, with the with the flying machines of today and the advent of consumer level drones, it's like it's literally become child's play to have flying machines and to be able to have different sensors on them, you know, so you can see stuff. That you wouldn't normally be able to see by remote but we're also getting to the point now we've got a little little article where we've got the possibility i'll oh, get me off the screen and we'll just share this screen here oh, i might have to do the windows capture thing again because my pc crashed and we go go to this one um there we go Vertical takeoff craft is not necessarily, and I'm not saying this is the only one or the best or whatever, but we'll have a look at this, this vertical takeoff craft then. So, because now we're starting to get in looking at um, having personal flying machines. And I know it's not, it's, it's not the UFO stuff we've been hoping for, which we might get that. But anyway, yeah, so let's have a look at this one then. So this is from um, a company called Lilium. So Lilium are introducing the first electric vehicle takeoff and landing jet. A nice, nice picture of it for the video viewers. It's very suave. It's a uh, black and white. It's got a black kind of fuselage. It's nice, smooth white wings. Not really sweeping. Just got two sets of wings, a big set and a smaller set. You know, it looks pretty suave and sophisticated and futuristic. Very uh, nice sweeping edges. And and we'll have a little read about this then. So it's got ducted electric vectored thrusters, so it can change the angle. Of the thrusters and the and the and the, the, there's a series of ducts on the wings they've got these uh, duct, ducting stuck to the top of them but a series of them on both both sets of wings so they've got these like lots of little independent jets it looks like so let's have a quick read so for your personal flying vehicle ducted electrical electric vector thrust the proprietary technology at the core of the ilium jet ducted electric vector thrust or deft which is how we've refined through refine this through successive generations of aircraft demonstrators electric jet engines integrated into the wing flaps provide advantages in payload aerodynamic efficiency and lower noise profile whilst also providing vector thrust control to maneuver the ilium jet through every phase of flight the underlying engine technologies. Traditional jet engines power 95% of commercial aircraft, and we have based our design on the same principles, yet far simpler. Our electric jet engines rely on just a single stage, a rotor stator system driven by an electric motor with zero emissions. It's designed for versatility, the Lilium jet can adapt for a range of customer uses with each configuration optimized for unparalleled experiences. The most spacious cabin arrangement is designed for private flights with luxurious club seating. Alternatively, the cabin can be configured with six seats for passenger flights or without seats to serve a zero emissions logistics market. five generations of flight. The Lilum is one of the only pioneers of the eVTOL, which is a vertical takeoff and landing. But this they've got here from because theirs is electric. So 
Lillam is one of the is one of the only pioneers of the e Vitol seeking engine certification. So they're trying to get it certified by uh, the FAA and the EASA. Since 2015, we've designed and built and tested five generations of technology demonstrators and invited the world to watch as we pioneer an aircraft and flight control system never seen before. So the Lilum vertical takeoff jet, see, it's, it's, we still haven't got the UFOs. It's still a jet, but I know there's been some kind of like sort of failed flying car versions but this one like it's still vertical takeoff though so although it's a little mini jet and it's got the wings which isn't ideal then kind of sweep up a little bit you know and that vertical takeoff with a vector thruster is pretty cool so i thought yeah that's 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 all right we're getting closer but like i say like i like to keep pointing out uh, okay to talk about ufos and that and they're obviously not using this kind of thing i mean vector thrusting is really useful but to for new maneuverability to be able to change the angle of the engine and and put it on the wing flaps have many engines but we used, we all know we've got the anti-gravity stuff so when it comes to the flying like i say we've got some funky stuff. we've been doing this for a long time and it looks like we're getting some really good stuff and i'm pretty sure that um i'm pretty sure the u.s navy uh yeah the u.s navy they they've been looking at a, a jet aircraft that can be a submarine as well that's the bit of a dream as well to be able to go from the sky straight into the ocean and then out of the ocean straight back into the sky again that's kind of hard to do we, currently we have two totally different vehicles for that but there's been been some work into in jets that can kind of dip in the water and come back out again as well so this is that little side note but yes but again so like flying i say flying machines and drones are literally child's play these days so it's the flying thing we've kind of got that one but on the next one, we're looking at for the next god power. I've just covered the Icarus and the and the drones. I thought for the next god power, obviously we've got um, the mind body inter uh, the brain interface with computers. Now obviously we interact with computers, and you know we've got metaverse coming in now with virtual reality. We're getting more and more kind of integrated. But there's you know direct computer brain to computer interfaces these days i mean that's that's kind of been going for a while as well and we covered in the psi weapons episode i think episode 14 where the university of pittsburgh had a had a man who was uh, paralyzed but they used the technology where he was able to use his brain to move prosthetic arms just by thought and to train it for a while to get to get used to the signal and train the computer to know this guy's brain signal of up and left and right and stuff and he was saying that if he focused too hard and it didn't quite work right, but if he, you know, if he just did it naturally, then then it kind of worked better because he was trying to find his natural signals. So we covered that University of Pittsburgh one. So I thought for this one, with with the next uh, God Power, we'll look at telepathy because we've got this mind body interface. And so that's Hermes. Hermes was well known for this. So Hermes can be related to the brain-computer interfaces because Hermes was the messenger of the Greek gods and was associated with communication and travel. So you can compare this to modern brain-computer interfaces that enable communication directly between the brain and external devices following a form of telepathy through the technology. And at this point, I have to give a shout-out to Patrick Flanagan for his invention of the neurophone, which we'll have a quick look at next. Da, da, da. so yes so dr patrick flanagan that's uh and this is on uh chopra.com like deep spot like deepak chopra chopra.com we've got um dr patrick flanagan so who's flanagan why does he get a shout out for the brain um computer interface because i think he's worth a shout out for this because dr patrick flanagan invented uh something called the neurophone back in 1958 and it's an electronic nervous i mean this is in the 50s this, let alone all the modern stuff we're going to sort of we looked at in the sci episode and then we'll look at in a minute so yeah 1958 patrick flanagan now uh at this time we would normally need to take a break so but i started a bit late but on a got my radio time in so i think what we'll do we'll just have a quick we'll make a shorter one so have a quick four minute break 
an examines podcast. Then we'll have a look at Patrick Flanagan's neurofoam, and then we're going to get into some really funky, funky science with the, the biology stuff. So we'll just play a little bit of music, have a little break, and uh, we're back talking about powers of the gods we've got today after Giant these short messages. Black monoliths. Metal boxes. And they have a fridge inside them that cools these chips to almost absolute zero. Hundreds of times older than interstellar space. These fridges have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. Is that a skull? So you're standing next to one of these black monoliths. I found it in the alien city. They really are impressive. That's a horrible souvenir. It feels like an altar to an alien god. Your robot brought us to the worst place yet. Everybody good? Plenty of slaves for my robot colony. Human Gimmer City. Look at them better with this unit. Pizza relaxes us. We have an engine. We can go anywhere. Preferably a place where the ground is not trying to eat you. You're tuned into Troubled Minds Radio Network on KUAP Digital Broadcasting, where we peer into the future, embrace the power of AI, and delve deep into the conspiracies that shape our world. Are you looking for a way to connect with your spirituality? Look no further than Spirit Magica Crystal Shop. They have a wide variety of crystals, from amethyst to obsidian and more, including crystal packs, unique deals, and amazing customer service. The products are made with the highest quality materials and are backed by their satisfaction guarantee. Spirit Magica Crystal Shop are committed to helping you find the tools and resources you need to live a magical life. So what are you waiting for? Visit Spirit Magica today. Use coupon code Troubled Minds, all one word, at checkout for 25% off your first purchase. For many centuries, witchcraft has been considered evil associated with the devil and all things dark. Let's break these stereotypes with your host, Matt Sal, in the Temple of the Hour. Let's talk about magic, as the old ways explore the many roles of the witch, learning the tools of the craft, the history of the science behind this ancient Earth-based religion, and the Trouble Mind Radio Network cable for digital broadcasting. Well, that's enough for the break then. Thanks for being with us in the Examines podcast. Me, your host, Liam Martin, talking about some of the ancient god powers as it's comparable to technologies that we've got today. So, yeah, I thought we'd have a look at that. I thought that'd be an interesting topic to uh, discuss. And, you know, I'll just mute this mic as it. Make a little adjustment. Yeah, and so, yeah, we just, just before the break, we got into talking about uh, Patrick Flanagan who invented the neurophone, which is pretty pretty nifty, really early example of uh, computer brain kind of interface stuff. So let's have a quick uh, read the skinny on Dr. Patrick Flanagan. So he invented the neurophone, as I say, in uh, 1958. It was an electronic nervous system excitation device that transmits sound through the skin directly to the brain, which is received, which received a US patent and the patent number is 3,393,279. And they got that patent in 1968. So it took 10 years to get it accepted. 
And I, I remember there's a bit of a side note on this story that um, Patrick Flanagan say it took 10 years to get accepted because they were saying that it can't be they thought that the sound being played on the skin must have been transmitted through the bones like that's some kind of vibration and then, and then i think there, there was an issue with that that they didn't accept that it worked the way he said it did and i hear the story goes that um they had to they got somebody in that was deaf that they had no no ability to hear that they had no cochlea that you need as a part of the hearing system it was missing from the brain so they brought somebody in who couldn't possibly have been hearing through the vibration through the bones and played it through the skin and because it's a nervous system excitation device it's still got a nervous system even though you might not have missing parts for the hearing and so therefore that person was able to hear the music but that person has never heard anything before so they knew it worked because when they did it apparently this person they brought in this deaf and never heard anything just started crying when they played this classical music so and i can imagine if you've literally never heard anything before and you can get your nervous system to bypass your hearing so your brain can still hear classical music despite not being able to hear that first ever thing to hear hearing some classical music would probably do something to you i would think especially because they're very harmonic and they're all in tune on their classical music it's kind of good for your plants it makes them grow it's you know so yes but anyway going on so yeah i guess the so patrick flanagan inventor of the neurophone in 1958 gets the pattern in 1968. the invention earned him a profile in life magazine and it was pretty heady heights which called him a unique mature and inquisitive scientist flanagan has continued to develop the neurophone and it is currently being sold as an aid to speed learning Flanagan, at age 11, developed a, a, and sold guided missile detector at age 11. Flanagan, let me say that again. Flanagan, at age 11, developed and sold a guided missile detector to the U.S. military. Age 17, he gained his air, air, airplane license and was employed at a think tank at the Pentagon. <laughs> And he was later a consultant at the NSA, the CIA, at NASA, Tufts University, and the Office of Naval Research, and Aberdeen Proving Grounds for the Department of Unconventional Weapons and Warfare. So this guy's like, mm, yeah. So he must have worked there, and that got him a bit of fame and got him into what, the, the CIA, the NSA, NASA. Wow. And the, <laughs> I love that. I love the name of this, the Aberdeen Proving Grounds for the Development for the Department of Unconventional Weapons and Warfare. That's, a, that's like a shield, isn't it? It's like a real mouthful, but it's not really got an acronym on that one. But yeah, since 1981, Flanagan has invented a series of useful devices and products based on water and specific mineral structures in the area of health. Several of these have been very successful in the market. His identification of the special properties of negative hydride ions while once ridiculed, got him serious attention with the when the Nobelist Shan Draseka, so a Nobel Nobelist, I guess a Nobel Prize winner, Shan Draseka, proposed it as a, a major component in far space. Several scientific papers by Flanagan about silica hydride hydride have been published in peer-reviewed journals such as the international journal of hydrogen energy and in a free radical biology and medicine so he sounds like a bit of a genius kind of guy flanagan actively continues his activities as a scientist and as an inventor and philanthropist promoting the really new sciences and the new approaches to human healing especially those based on the great traditions of indian egyptian healing for decades, Dr. Flanagan has openly in, in, invited stringent scrutiny of his research and discoveries by the medical and scientific communities. The seeds of his efforts are blossoming at an exponential rate as the scientific community is validating and embracing his extraordinary contributions. Academics and researchers at universities from Oxford to Stanford are beginning to study Dr. Flanagan's breakthrough discoveries and teach them to the scientists of the future. So it just goes to show, just goes to show that, you know, 10 years of trying to get his patent proved. And once he proved it, 
that's it. Suddenly you're in and they realize, no, you're a genius. You've, so that's, so that's a nice story of a little breakthrough there. So that's brain computer interface, but there's more with this as uh, we'll see if we just get back to my script there. So we've had a shout out to Patrick Flanagan on his invention of the neurofoam. And I was sticking with Hermes telepathy and the, you know, being the messenger of the gods associated with communication and travel. Hermes and brain computer interface also goes on. It goes further really in a um, bionic control. And we've got, we've had prosthetic limbs for a while, but now we're getting really, really good with them. Really good. Like we say, we had that guy that was from uh, Pitt, Pittsburgh University, uh, had the man who was paralyzed from the neck down, was able to hog his daughter. But now we're getting uh, ex extra sort of more delicate and exquisite control. So new... So from Euronews.com, we've got a new Barnic hand, which uses um, can control uh, individual fingertips, and it's like got on with unprecedented accuracy. And it shows an image of a guy using one of these prosthetic ones, holding a ball with his finger and thumb. So you're getting like serious control with these things now. So yeah, like let's say this is from um, Euronews.com, and the article is from the four yeah it's from 2023 from uh, the middle of the year la last year so successful testing of bionic hand has already been conducted on patients who lost an arm above the elbow in a world first surgeons and engineers have developed a new bionic hand that allows users with arm amputations to effortlessly control each finger as though it were their own body the innovation could revolutionize the way prosthetic limbs are designed and used with scientists hailing it as as a quote major breakthrough prosthetic limbs can help people regain some functionality they lost after an amputation but that can be challenging to control and sometimes unreliable with only a limited range of movement typical prosthesis use uh, sorry, typical prosthesis use remnant muscles, the muscles that remain in the residual limb after the amputation. They are the most common source of controlling of controlling a prosthetic hand because the signals in the muscles produced when they are were contracted are uh, my myelectric signals that can be generated by the user at will. So it's trying to take the same signals from your muscles. That's the usual, usual way to do it. However, for individuals with amputations higher up the arm, such as above the elbow, transhumeral amputations, then it can be more challenging. In such cases, insufficient muscle remains to generate this uh, myelectric signal to enable control of the lost arm and hand joints, meaning the control of the prosthetic limb in a way that feels natural is simply just not possible. It's just not possible if it's above the elbow, not enough muscle left to be able to control it properly and control it naturally. In a new era of bionic hands, the key to the new bionic hand described in the study published by Science Translational Medicine is a technique called neuromuscular reconstruction. In this procedure, surgeons rewire the nerves in the residual limb so they control muscles uh, so they, they control different muscles so they get a rewiring this allows users to generate more complex movements with the bionic hand such as flexing and extending all five fingers to pick up small objects or type on a keyboard that's pretty good if you can keyboard type that is that's not bad if we do it with the individual fingers that's that's getting good i would say okay this is a quote here so when the patient tries to do movements with the missing hand, those new muscular structures get activated. Max Ortez Catalan says, the director, that's the director of the Center for Bionics and Pain Research in Sweden, Max Ortez Catalan, and also the head of neuro, neuroprosthetics research at Bionics Institute in Australia and a professor of bionics at Chalmers University Technology in Sweden. 
and he, he he's told the, the he told the Euro news that when the electrodes he goes on to explain some of it how it works so then as we put electrodes inside them we can extract that information use an artificial intelligence algorithm to look at those electrical pulses that come from different sources and learn the patient and learn what the patient is trying to do so again like the previous example i talked about where the guy was paralyzed from the waist down they have to so they've got these electrodes in and they have to get you to practice movements or practice imagining the movements and what we you know your intention i suppose the up down the left and the right and the computer monitors it for a bit and it and it and it it's the algorithm is trying to figure out what your natural movements are for like left right or down your directional movements is trying to figure out what your signals are once it's got your signals then you know things things start it, it, like it can, they can then like sync sync the machine in to what your signals are going to be like and then it's like having your having your your limb is your own sort of thing so yeah so that's what the electrical pulses again all the different sources like the rewiring that they've done the computer wants all that information from all those different muscles that are being controlled from all the different movements that you do. It wants all that kind of metadata to try and sync up to be the same as you. So once it's learned, which happens very quickly, then you can tell the prosthesis what to do. Prosthetic limbs are typically attached to the body with a socket that compresses the residual limb, making it mechanically unstable and uncomfortable. But the new bionic hand also tackles this problem. Besides the neuromuscular reconstruction, the new implant also features a titanium implant that is placed within the residual bone, connecting it to the body. This provides a more stable and comfortable attachment point for the hand, while also allowing a more natural movement. This is a major breakthrough in the field of bionic limbs, Ortez Catalan says, as it opens up the possibility of creating bionic hands they're as functional as natural hands. So they've got a new way to plug it in as well, as well as a way to, to retask your muscles to work differently so you can still get the, the extra control, even if you've got an amputation above the elbow. So that's pretty cool. So yes, okay, I'll read that again. This this is a major breakthrough in the field of bionics, says Ortez Catalan. It opens up the possibility of creating bionic hands that are as functional as natural hands. The achievement is based on over 30 years of gradual development of the concept in which I'm proud of contributing to, said Dr. Ricard Braymark, who is a leading expert in assess, <laughs> integrate, OCSS integration of limbs prosthesis. Who, so that's going to be, yeah, to do with bones, the way it connects, I think. So that's it. Yeah, so commercially it'd be a commercially available soon as well i remember remember this is from uh, midway last year so they're looking at the um saying that this might be coming soon commercially available hopefully soon so the new bionic hand was successfully tested on a 52 year old swedish male patient tone who lost his arm above the elbow in a workshop tone reportedly learned to control the implant quickly and easily as well as to perform a variety of tasks with it, including moving his fingers. In 2020, Tone and the research team at uh, Chalmers University Technology participated in the Cyberthlon. I'm not sure what the Cyberthlon is, but okay, it's an international athletic competition for people who use assistive technologies. Okay, okay. Almost like a little mini Paralympics then. Okay, so this guy's used it and took part in that. And according to the research team, Tone used the prosthetics in his daily life over three years now, and he's still using them. Oh, so he's back from 2020 then. This written in mid-2023, so they're giving an update. So it's it's been functional then for three years, been working fine the whole time. So the development of the new bionic hand is a sign of hope for people with amputations, Close to 60 million people were living with limb amputations due to the tra traumatic causes in 2017 worldwide. So that's 60 million people in 2017. A few years now, six, what? Yeah. Hmm. 60 million. That is a lot. 
that's according to the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. The device, this, this, bionic, this bionic arm, the device currently in, is still in trials, but the research team is actively working with surgeons and professionals in prosthetics around the world to bring this technology to patients. This combination of surgical procedures and a bionic hand was the first time, but now that we know it's reliable and can be conductive for better control, people are going to start implementing it, Ortez Catalan told Euronews. The new regulations in Europe have made it a bit more challenging to bring new products to the market, but we hope that we can bring this technology to more people relatively soon, they've added. So hopefully some of these super duper controller limbs will be, uh, you know, the more delicate touch situation. They'll be able to hopefully get that cooking. Instead of spending money on war, maybe get some of this research anyway. <laughs> anyway. It just I gets, I don't want to go into that war talk stuff, but it just gets my goat and people are cheering for people to die. And it costs loads of money to do wars. And you could be doing stuff like this. You know, 60 million people, these limbs, I don't know how much they cost, but you know what I'm saying? We could have could have done a lot by now. But any, anywho, yes, Barnic Arm Diabetes. That's what I'm talking about. Anyway, yes, Barnic Control, doing, talking about the telepathy and the Hermes. And yeah, ghost arm in as well. But let's have a look at this. So yes, yeah, so we looked at the binary control breakthrough. Let's have a look what this next article is. I just remind myself there was script here. While this loads up, should we do? Be do is a, another breakthrough. Okay, so from is this the NIH? Yeah, from the NIH. So this is a. A direct brain-to-brain -brain interface in humans. And so is introduction. Many of the greatest contemporary technological uh, developments have centered on advancing human communication. From the telegraph to the internet, the primary utility of these game-changing innovations has been to increase the range of audiences that individuals can reach. However, most current methods for communicating are still limited to words and symbols available to the sender or understood by the receiver. Even when they include nonverbal content, communication constraints can be severe. A great deal of the information that is available to our brain is not introspectively available to our consciousness and thus cannot be voluntarily put in linguistic form. For instance, Knowledge about one's own fine motor control is completely opaque to the subject and thus cannot be verbalized. As a consequence, a trained surgeon or a skilled violinist cannot simply tell a novice how to exactly position and move the fingers during the execution of critical hand movements. But even knowledge that is introspectively available can be difficult to verbalize. Brilliant teachers may struggle to express abstract scientific concepts in language, and everyone is familiar with the difficulty of putting one's own feelings into words. Even when knowledge can be expressed in words, one might face the hurdle of translating between the existing spoken human languages. Can, in, can information that is available in the brain be transferred directly in the form of neurocode, bypassing language altogether is the question we explore this idea in the rest of this article so the idea of direct brain to brain communication could potentially be achieved by using brain to brain interfaces bbis bbis rest on two pillars the capacity to read or decode useful information from neural activity and the capacity to write or encode digital information back into neural activity in recent years, we have witnessed an incredible progress of these two capabilities with development of brain-computer interfaces or BCIs. BCI researchers have demonstrated the possibility of decoding motor, visual, and even conceptual information from neural activity via a range of recording techniques such as implanted electrodes, electro course tachography, or an ECOG, electroencephalography, which is an EEG, or functional MRI scans, or there's an MEEG as well. And there's a variety of stimulation techniques also exist to permit the users to encode digital information into neural activity, including implemented 
electrodes, transcranial magnetic stimulation devices. I'll show one of them in a minute. And a focused ultrasound, which is uh, called FUS, F-U-S, focused ultrasound. And the, these are prominent examples of BCIs, brain computer interfaces that use stimulation, including cochlear implants and deep brain stimulators. And see, I mentioned the cochlear earlier with the person that didn't have an air, the Flanagan's neurophone. But here, but you also get cochlear implants where you get an implant into your head. And yeah. And it, yeah. So for hearing. Okay. So given these. <laughs> What's, what's that in the chat? Let's check it out. So Rico's in the chat as well. Hi, I didn't think I said hi. I didn't see you there. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, yes, skewed vows in society. People want war, unfortunately. People just want to fight and I don't know. You don't want to be in it. It's all right until you're in it, the war thing, I reckon. But yeah, what's Dr. Levy saying? What would be exciting is to watch two individual of bionic arms in a boxing match. That would be a super boxing match. Well, I wonder if, but I've wondered about that right from the beginning of talking about this stuff decades ago. I've wondered, will the Olympics have to be changed? Would it be like another type of Olympics or a, another thing? I just changed my mic there. Is, there, is it going to be because, like, if you have bionic legs and you're doing sprinting, it's not going to be kind of fair, is it? If you've got, if you've got that, all that going on. So I don't know. I don't know how it works. No, I just sort my mic out. But yeah, so uh, yeah. So a disadvantage can then become an advantage with technologies. And then, you know, do you have to change the rules and stuff or what? But then you might get separate leagues of sports where people have got these super like add ons and these super gadgets and stuff. But anyway, yes. So, but the technology is getting better. I mean, anyway, I'll read on, I'll read on, do a bit more of this and then uh, we'll go for a break. So, so we've got these. Okay, so we can potentially control the motor cortex. Right, okay, so given that these advancements of BCIs, the two recent efforts have addressed the question of whether direct brain-to-brain -brain -brain communication is possible with the technologies we have today. But we know that but this, this stuff has been explored and the possibility to directly connect uh, the brains of two awake and behaving rats. In his experiments, they got... What one rat? Yeah, they got these two rats to act as a encoder and a decoder and a receiver. So yeah, I'll get a just a little image up for the video viewers. It's a little bit of a diagram, and basically you, you can do it with people as well. They started off with rats, and then they could do it with people. Where you could play this game, where you just gotta like shoot a missile over to this or island kind of thing. But they just did it using thought. So it shows you a little diagram of a monitor and a game on it, and there's a and there's a remote desktop connecting it to another computer. So there's two different computers, two different people. One of them's looking at a game, right? And that game is with his with the, with his thought on this game. This guy's got a he's got one of these uh, transcranial things on his head, which I'll just show a quick picture of just to explain what one of those is a transcranial magnetic stimulation device is a non-invasive uh, brain stimulator so you don't have to go into a person's head with it and basically so it's like a cap on top of your head electrodes and that you play a game we've got to like shoot a bomb over to this other island and if you get it right then it goes through, through, through to the other computer and it does the reverse with the transcranial implant uh, cap uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation rod Thing, donut thing that you hold above the person's head it can cause control of the person's arm so then if you think the game and think the missile to go over to the other island if you get it then it causes somebody else's arm to press a button so you're controlling their arm with your thought of doing something it makes their arm move so i thought that was pretty pretty wild there's a pretty pretty crazy one that's on the uh, nih website as well so I want to check that out, Na uh, National uh, Library of Medicine. So it's all referenced. I didn't put the links in the description today because I forgot, but because I was having a few issues. But anyway, anyway, I'm going to get back onto some more God Powers in a minute. Uh, time's really against us, as always. We've got, uh, got to take another break here. So let's drop some more music in.
and we'll be back just after this an examines podcast with me Liam Martin we the Chigos have the same God all right this ain't church retrieve the collateral damage and move out this is just a shortcut though you don't even know the shit and so you'll grab you you'll throw you in a corner and you'll say did you know that if it's a middle word in life Hey, Vance, why are they calling aliens and shit? Because they look like chickens. They're like leaves. They burn themselves in your skin. You don't understand the first thing about humans. They are at their most formidable. When they're threatened. That challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone. What? What am I doing? 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 Oh, it looks like we're back. I don't know, is the stream still going? Oh, it's still going. Oh, sorry about that, folks. Everything just crashed out. We did the break, and everything just froze up on me. I don't know what happened there. I restarted the browser. I don't know if anyone's still there. Did I miss it? Well, dang. No, I'm back. No, I don't know if it's still going. Let me know if it's still going, guys. Let me know if it's still going, because everything's had to just kill the internet for a minute. And uh, I don't know what happens when you do that, because it's never happened before. Are you still here? Are you still here? Oh, Daryl's still here. Oh, we're, we're still going then. Screw it then. Let's go on. Because I wanted to get this one finished. So, yes, right then. I'll just have to just do a quick little retell that way to look. Shooby dooby doob. Right, let's do it. Let's get back on the case. Thank God for that. It's never crashed on me. The internet's never crashed on me before when I've done the stream. So I didn't know what I didn't know what happens. But I just re restarted it and it just it's still going. So. Yes. We here. We are here. Well, let's do it then. Let's let's carry on. Because I thought I was gonna have to shut things down. But no, we're not gonna do that. So let's let's have a look at this then. So next on the agenda. So we looked at what did we look at first? We looked at the we've done flying machines and drones are just ten a penna and we looked at some we've got them vertical takeoff crafts are getting a bit more viable now. We looked at uh we talked about the guy who was paralyzed. Uh, from the neck down, and he got to control his arms. But then we looked at a more funky. They're getting really good with motor control now. They can control individual fingers and stuff, and type on the keyboard. With some of these arms, we looked at Patrick Flanagan with the neurophone, playing music on the skin to uh, stimulate the nervous system. So, and hoping to use that as um, a speed learning tool. So yes, yeah, so yeah, so we looked at the flying machines. Uh, of the likes of Icarus to compare that to one god's telepathy with Hermes and brain computer interfaces, which what with the patch of Flanagan was, and we had a little look at that and ghosting somebody else's arm using brain to brain interface through computers where you could play a game using thought, which would then control another person who's got a who's got a one of these transcranial magnetic stimulators above the head. You can then control that person's brain by thinking the game and then control that person's brain to control their arm to like press a button and do a movement, to get motor control. And so, yes, so next on the agenda, we're going to look at, now we've looked at the transcranial magnetic stimulation device. We're going to look at another god. What about Apollo? Apollo the healer. So in Greek mythology, Apollo was a god of healing. 
So we can therefore relate that and explore modern medical technologies from advanced surgeries to genetic therapies that parallel the concepts of advanced tools in healing for preserving health, a godlike healing abilities. And, and so we're getting into DARPA funded implants. DARPA got permission to have these implants in limbs. So, and some other stuff. So let's have a look. This is for, again, for the prosthetics, we've got uh, one DARPA using limbs and we've got another DARPA one uh, for mental health as well. So starting off with wiredmagazine.co.uk. Headline is, DARPA-funded implants travel to the brain via the blood vessels. This neural recording device, which is implemented into the brain through the blood vessels, so let's say that again, it's a neural recording device. So they're going to literally, <laughs> literally spying on you from inside your blood vessels. Typical DARPA. Just kidding. Any kidding, guys. Anyway, yes. This neural recording device which is implemented into the brain through the blood vessels, will make it easier to control artificial limbs from the brain. Is that like nanobots we're talking about? These tiny, the tiny devices can be developed by DARPA, by, has been developed by DARPA-funded research, tested in animals, and is set for human trials as soon as 2017. So you can bet your bippy that that's been done by now, the human trials. Come on, 2017. She's ready to start doing them. So there, yeah. Okay, so going on. Dubbed the the Stentrode by the bioengineers who created it, the device will provide a non-invasive way to explore the use of brain machine interfaces. Researchers from the University of Melbourne, in a published paper in Nature Biotechnology, use the device to record the brain activity of sheep for 190 days. Quote. Here we demonstrate the feasibility of chronologically recording brain activity from within a vein using passive stent electrode recording array. So that's why they call them stent roads for short. So it's a passive stent electrode recording array. And this research was led by Tom Oxley, who wrote the paper. To implant electrodes into the brain at present, invasive brain surgery is needed. But the new DARPA funded research could remove the need for risky procedures. The Sten road makes it okay, so the Sten road makes it way makes its way to the brain after being inserted via a catheter into the blood vessel in the neck. The researchers then used real-time imaging to guide the devices to the location in the brain where Stendrode expands and attaches itself to the walls of the blood vessels to read the activity of neurons. So it's just like nanobots, isn't it? In your brain, the Star Trek stuff, seven of nine, kind of like assimilator stuff, isn't it? Nanobots, wow, crazy. The DARPA-funded research is the latest attempt by the agency to increase the ease of use of the brain-machine interfaces. In 2013, the agency created an artificial limb which communicates directly with the wearer's neurosystem, which we've looked at some of these, and it's building on the previous work of agencies revealed a prosthetic hand that's connected directly to the brain in 2015. Okay. So they're bypassing the arm interface and going directly to the brain then. Is that like remote control? The prosthetic hand is allowed to do... Let's say this again. The prosthetic hand allowed a 28-year-old paralyzed volunteer to feel sensations for the first time in 10 years. So maybe that had some haptic feedback on the prosthetic hand. Yes, go DARPA. Go psh. In December 2014, BrainGate, a research group of experts from leading universe, US universities, created a system that allowed an almost fully, par fully paralyzed woman to control a prosthetic limb to complete basic tasks such as raising a drink from a glass. So some fascinating little nanobot technology there from coming from DARPA to help with um, the the limit, the brain machine interface to control of limbs. And again from DARPA, once again, they're getting in your head. And this is from extremetech.com, 2014 article, this one. So 10 years old now. 
DARPA's tiny implants will hook directly into your nervous system, treat diseases and depression without medication. So literally, they're going for the mental health side of things now. Get right in there. So DARPA, on the back of the US government's brain program, has begun the development of tiny electronic implants that interface directly with your nervous system and can directly control or regulate many different diseases and chronic conditions such as arthritis, PTSD, inflammatory bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, uh, and depression as well. The program called Electrex, or ElectRx, pronounced Electrix, ultimately aims to replace medication with closed loop neuro implants, which constantly assess the state of your health and then provide the necessary nerve stimulation to keep your various organs and biological systems functioning properly. Well, straight away, what comes to mind there for me is that if you put in closed loop neuro implants, which are constantly assessing your state of health and will provide the necessary nerve stimulation to keep your various organs, biological systems functioning properly. It sounds good, but if you've got the, what if, if that's mood control stuff, what if it's behavioral control stuff? What if they get government orders to send a government program in there to tell you to be compliant? Is that a possible, mm, you know, because government likes to be control everything because that's what it's for, to try and control things and manage things, isn't it? So, but, it, but it's naturally going to get out of control if somebody doesn't tell it not to. So that's where we have to look with these technologies. We always have to look at the ethical concerns and how they might impact on societies and change them, you know. But these these are some really breakthrough technologies, really breakthrough technologies. Anyway, let's, uh, let's carry on reading. So DARPA, on the back of the US government's brain program, has begun the development of tiny electronic implants that interface directly with your nervous system and can directly control and regulate regulate many different diseases and chronic conditions such as arthritis, PTSD, inflammatory bowel syndrome, as I mentioned, with these closed loop neuro implants, which constantly assess the state of your health to provide the right stimulation so your biological systems can function properly. The work is primarily being carried out with US soldiers and veterans in mind, but the technology will certainly percolate down to civilians as well. The electrics program will focus on a fairly new area of medical therapies called neuromodulation. As the name implies, neuromodulation is all about modulating your nervous system to improve or fix an underlying problem. Notable examples of neuromodulation are cochlear implants, which restore hearing to directly modulating your brain's auditory nervous system. The deep brain stimulation, DBS, which appears to be capable of curing or regulating various conditions such as depression and Parkinson's by overriding erroneous neurospikes with regulated healthy stimulations. So here's an idea. That's an, another way to say that. It's a bit wordy, that is. So I think another way to say that is, to think of it, is that it's, it's going to filter things out that you don't want, a bit like this streaming software that I use, the last time I did a stream, most of the time I do a stream, when I play music, sometimes the music didn't come through properly, and I tried to play a YouTube video, and the sound didn't come through at all. And there was no, and I know the signal was there. So I discovered that this restream software has a has an echo cancellation option. So I switched it off, and suddenly the music's coming through. So that must have been hearing that must have some kind of algorithm that's expecting you know podcast voice and anything else it will try and filter it out thinking it might be an echo or some background noise so it does such a good filtering job that if i leave that switched on you know that filter switched on you can't play music very well or nothing at all mm -hmm. on youtube and stuff because it's just filtering it out filtering out the signal and adjusting for it you know a bit like this uh overriding erroneous neuro spikes with uh, a regulated healthy stimulation a bit like the software was doing for me the other day you know it's trying to get rid of things that it thought was background noise sort of thing so anyway moving on so far these implants have been fairly big things about the size of a deck of cards which makes the implantation fairly invasive and thus quite risky 
Most state-of-the-art implants also lack precision. Stimulating electrodes are usually placed uh, thoroughly, uh, roughly in the right area, but it's currently very hard to target specific nerve fibers, a bundle of nerves. With electrics, DARPA wants to miniaturize these neuromodulation implants so that they're the same size as a nerve fiber. This way, they can be implanted with with a minimal invasion procedures, minimally inv invasive procedures, perhaps through a needle, attached to specific nerve fibers for a very precise stimulation. While these implants can't regulate every condition or replace every medication, at least not yet, they could be very effective at mitigating a large number of conditions. Basically, a large number of conditions are caused by your nervous system misfiring, most notably inflammatory diseases, but also potentially brain and mental health disorders can be corrected with the misfirings using these technologies. Currently, a variety of drugs are used to try to cajole the array of the neurons and the nerves back in alignment by manipulating various neurotransmitters. But the same effect could be created with an electronic implant that catches the misfirings, cleans up the signal, and then retransmits it, which I think could be a lot cleaner way to do it, especially if you could monitor exactly what's happening. And it'd be fascinating to see which neurotransmitters that keep misfiring for you. You know, it'd be like having, um, you know, the little gauges that you have on a motor car. You have little gauges, a little light that comes on to tell you when the you know, oil's low, although you should probably know by then. But you know, and or or if the engine's overheating, you get little light warning lights that come on and things to tell you stuff, don't you? So if you if you could see your own warning lights, you would actually probably do something about it, wouldn't you? If you could have it, if your body could send you a text message and say, I need more magnesium and zinc or something, you'd be like, Yeah, sure. Sure. Do you need any potassium? What are you doing for potassium? I got some bananas. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd do it, wouldn't you? It's just such a, such a, you know, like a, you can't see the wood for the trees trying to figure out, you have to become a nutritionist, don't you, to know what's what's the right stuff to be doing. But if you could see your body a bit more, you don't have to keep going for tests. That'd be pretty cool. Maybe that's, maybe that, maybe that's something we'll have in the future. Maybe rather than, maybe we'll, yeah, maybe we'll have like these like kind of nanobots that'll be able to tell us what condition our body's in. So you don't kind of need to go to a doctor to see what condition you're in. You can see what condition you're in and then maybe like go and get advice from perhaps we'll have multifaceted doctors. We will have like, you know, more nutritionists around because the, because people know what the nutritional rates are. So already, because they've got these nanobots, do you know what I'm saying? So I mean, because I can't fix that if you haven't got enough minerals, but you can go and get them. You can, you just need the vital information, don't you? And then you can maybe go to, you know, your Holland and Barrett and whatnot, go and get your nutrition. Maybe you could do a bit of, maybe that's how the future will be. You'll be able to see and monitor your own health a bit more. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Who knows how the world's, world's changing fast, man. It's changing fast. But anyway, next on the agenda, like I say, on about adjustments and monitoring your own health, Next on the agenda is a biohacking, which is another sort of like, um, I'm just going in with the Apollo here in the uh, healing abilities. But again, biohacking, got like powers, you can, you can take it into your own hands. So biohacking is a fascinating field that involves using technology to modify or enhance biological systems. And it encompasses a wide range of practices from DIY biology, genetic engineering to wearable technology and body enhancements. Biohackers explore ways to optimize human performance, improve health, and even augment sensory capabilities using tools like implants, genetic modifications, or devices that interact with the body's natural systems. It's a diverse and evolving area that blends biology, engineering, and innovation in some really cool ways. So let's have a look at this next one then. Biohacking. And this is from Medical News Today. And we're going to look at it today, although it wasn't written today. It was written, if I slide right up to the top, it might tell me. Don't know. But anyway, yeah, what is biohacking? Let's have a look then. So biohacking is DIY form of, it's a DIY form of human enhancement and augmentation, in which people attempt to change aspects of their biology to improve their health, performance, or well-being. 
Some types of biohacking has been around for many years, such as intermittent fasting. Technology-based biohacking, such as smartwatches and Fitbits, provide people with a wealth of data about their bodies, allowing them to tweak their health to improve athletic performance. People may want to hack their body for various reasons, such as to have control over their health, explore new and unusual ideas, to fix the way they perceive as fix what they perceive as flaws, or to try and extend their lives. Some examples are neurotropics. One of the popular forms of biohacking is a substance called neurotropics or smart drugs. Non-prescription nootropics include tablets, supplements, drinks, and foods. They contain substances that may help to boost brain performance, examples including creatine and, caf and uh, caffeine. Prescription uh, nootropics are medications that have uh, stimul stimulant effects, which doctors may prescribe for medical conditions such as Alzheimer's disease or tension or ADHD. There's also uh, some examples of the stuff there is obviously you've got, you've got Ritalin that people have heard of, Adderall used to treat ADHD, so Ritalin as well, and also for Alzheimer's, there's a um, Exora or Memetine. The Memetine is used to treat Alzheimer's disease. A person should never take these prescriptions, obviously, unless, unless a doctor's uh, said them. You've also got the wearable technologies, like smart watches, uh, head-mounted displays, fitness tracking bands to have the, the memory stuff. Uh, you've got uh, these are commonplace these days, common pieces of modern technology. You've got um, other examples of biohacking is called the DIY biohacking has kind of caught my interest. So you get DIY biohacking where some people also called garage biology <laughs> involves experts in scientific fields sharing biohacking techniques and information with people who are not experts. This allows more people to conduct experiments on themselves outside of the uh, outside of constrained environments. Some people consider DIY biology as an open revolution against the academic institutionalization of science and aim to spread an attitude of citizen science action research without rigid gatekeepers. They believe DIY biology generates more ideas, freedom, inclusivity, and improvisation. DIY biology includes various fields of biohacking, such as microbiology, nutrition, biomedical and synthetic biology. So we've got Nutrigenomics. Nutrigenomics is another biohacking type that focuses on how food interacts with people's genes. So you're trying to hack your genes by learning about that stuff and putting the right foods in there. That was sort of one about earlier. And you can hack your genes in different ways, which you can also do with breathing techniques. So we found with Wim Hof and yoga, then, you know, you're starting to, you can change your body, right? In theory, Right down to the genes, you could be able to change anything in theory if it's your genes. But anyway, it goes on to say, likewise, it explores a person's gene effects on the body and, and response to food. Researchers are using nutrigenomics to learn more about the diet and genes and how they may affect a person's health risks and help find new ways to prevent and treat diseases. A person can send a DNA sample to a specialized laboratory where their genetic makeup is analyzed and their healthcare team can use the results to create an optimized nutritional plan. This may involve avoiding certain foods linked to conditions that are genetically predisposed to. So, yes. So another example, you can sort of start to affect your genes and your, and your very look at your DNA structure and it start to affect your genes as well. And then, of course, there's gene editing stuff, which we'll get to next. But we've got to take another little break. Stay tight on the radio clock. Keep practicing. So let's just whack some more music on, just put that on. And we'll be back on the Exile Minds podcast right after this short break. Back in a second. From the outside, they look like giant black monoliths. Little metal boxes. They have a fridge inside them. It cools these chips to almost absolute zero. Hundreds of times colder than interstellar space. These fridges have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. 
Is that a skull? So if you're standing next to one of these black monoliths. I found it in the alien city. They really are impressive. That's a horrible souvenir. It feels like an altar to an alien god. There it is. Your robot brought us to the worst place yet. Everybody do it. Find your slaves for my robot colony. We have a robot, we have an engine, we can go anywhere. Preferably a place where the ground is not try to eat. You're tuned into Troubled Minds Radio Network on KUAP Digital Broadcasting, where we peer into the future, embrace the power of AI, and delve deep into the conspiracies that shape our world. Are you looking for a way to connect with your spirituality? Look no further than Spirit Magica Crystal Shop. They have a wide variety of crystals, from amethyst to obsidian and more, including crystal packs, unique deals, and amazing customer service. The products are made with the highest quality materials and are backed by their satisfaction guarantee. Spirit Magica Crystal Shop are committed to helping you find the tools and resources you need to live a magical life. So what are you waiting for? Visit Spirit Magica today. Use coupon code Troubled Minds, all one word, at checkout for 25% off your first purchase. For many centuries, witchcraft has been considered evil associated with the devil and all things dark. Let's break these stereotypes with your host, Matt Sow, in the Temple of the Hour. Let's talk about magic, as the old ways explore the many roles of the witch, learn the tools of the craft, the history of the science behind this ancient Earth-based religion, and the Trouble Mind Radio Network cable for digital broadcasting. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for being with me with the break there. Examines podcast back to talk about some of the godlike powers that we've got today with modern technology to distinguish ourselves as magicians to flip the Odyssey clock quote there. Anyway, yes, have a quick look in the chat. I thought I saw Algo in the, in there earlier. He said, "Did I miss it? When it all, all went all kind of crap and crashed? Well, dang! I hope he's still there." because uh, we've managed to get it still going. Just quickly restart the internet, and everything was was fine. So that's good. So, yes, we're going to chat there. So it just crashed out, so that's all that happened there. And what do we got? Isn't it like Brave New World novel? Happy pill in the technology. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking, Enrico. That's, that's like we are saying about if you've got nanobots in your head and then start going into your nervous system to control your mood, that's all well and good if you've agreed to it. But maybe then, maybe somebody says, maybe some doctor says, some psychiatrist, some physician, whatever says, you've got a particular condition. And then they, they set your nanobots for that condition. But maybe you don't have the condition. Or maybe that can the treatment for that condition happens to make you more placid. Right? And then governments get thinking, oh, we could do we getting the numbers up of this condition so we can have an excuse to treat people and make them more placid and make them more, you know what I mean? Make them a bit more <laughs> compliant because that, I mean, Aldous Huxley and Julian Huxley used to say 
not not hiding it and used to write books and stuff and say these to say look we're in the we're in in a we're in the process this is decades ago they said we're in the process of developing a series of techniques to get people to love servitude because that's preferable than line than firing squads and billy clubs they want you to just be compliant anyway and placid and just go along and just do whatever because then they don't have to control you then you don't have to have revolutionary wars to overthrow the king and because it's got too bad no they want people to just accept it it seems that's what they were saying decades ago and it's kind of seems like it's going that way anyway moving on to moving on to godlike powers and technologies this one's pretty cool this next one is a uh, night vision give yourself some night vision now of course we've got night vision goggles but this is night vision with your own eyeballs a special night vision goggles without the goggles better to use your own eyes so check this out this is uh, mainstream news as well from the independent independent.co.uk so night vision through eye drops how about that night vision eye drops allow vision of up to 50 meters in darkness these eye, eye drops have been created by a team of californian biohackers so it may sound like something straight out of Q's laboratory, James Bond, or the latest Marvel film, but a group of scientists in California have successfully created eye drops that temporarily enable night vision. Science for the Masses, an independent citizen science organization that operates from the city of Tecapi, theorized that uh, a substance called chlorine, E6, or CE6 is a nat is a natural molecule that can be created from algae, from algae, algae and other green plants, and it could enhance night sight in dark environments. It couldn't, so that's coming from plants and algae. You get this CE6 natural molecule, and it can enhan enhance your eyesight for dark environments. Okay, so the molecule is found in some deep sea fish form. It forms the basis of some cancer therapies too, and it's been previously described as intravenously for night blindness. Okay, so let's let's read on. Jeff Tibbetts lab. Oh, oh my computer's crashing out again. What's going on? Hello, just flashing on and off for a minute. Okay, let's go on. Jeff Tibbetts, the lab's medical officer, said. There is a fair amount of papers talking about having injected it in models like rats, and it's been intravenously given since the 1960s as treatment for different cancers. After doing the research, you have to take the next step. The next step is to moisten the eyes of biochemical researcher and a willing guinea pig, which, so they've got a human guinea pig, so to speak, called Gabrielle. Licinis. So we're going to use her eyes to administer 50 microliters of CE6. The effect was apparently almost instantaneous. After an hour, he was able to distinguish shapes from 10 meters away in the dark, and soon it was an even greater distance. We had people go stand in the woods, and Licini said, at 50 meters, I could figure who they were even if they were standing up against a tree. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, trying to camouflage yourself against a tree 50 metres away in the dark, in the woods. That's not bad, is it? I can tell you the person, identify the person. The effect of the chemical only lasted for hours and the test subject's eyesight returned to normal the next day. The organisation has released papers that detailed the experiment on their website. It says that more research will will be needed to be conducted in, in order to measure the actual amount of electrical stimulation increase in the eye, whilst the long-term effects of the procedure will require further investigation, which is fair enough. Cautious approach, because your eyes as well, you don't want to be messing with them too much, but seem to be able to get night vision from these eye droplets. And Tibbet goes on to say that this success is a perfect demonstration of the work that his organization conducts. For us, it comes down to pursuing things that are doable but won't be pursued by major corporations. I suppose like they're drinking the maybe juice, aren't they? There are rules 
to be followed and we don't want to go crazy but science isn't a mystical language that only a few elite people can speak so power to the people tebits and you've uh, given us night vision potentially so that's a that's a pretty good nice little godlike power there to increase your night vision with c6 eye drops and in duke university they've managed to do some interesting experiments with rats uh, giving them the ability to yeah you know, check this out rats got a new ability that they didn't have before so let's just get rid of all this jazz on the screen okay right new scientist from newscientist.com rats learn to sense infrared in hours thanks to brain implants so back to the dark of brain implants again rats brains quickly adapted to use data from four infrared sensors allowing them to see in the dark and paving the way for augmentations for human brains brains get uh, data about the world through sensors sight hearing taste smell and touch in the lab in northern california a group of rats is getting uh, that one extra and that's thanks to implants in their brain of them to sense and react to infrared light the rats show the brain's ability to process unfamiliar data an earlier step towards augmenting the human brain because it's data you, you wouldn't normally need to be sensing so this is from duke university of medicine uh, is leading the experiment so we've got miguel nicola nicolis miguel nicolis from yeah, duke university his team has implanted four clusters of electrodes in the rat's uh, barrel cortex, the part of the brain that handles whisker sensation. Each cluster is connected to a sensor that converts infrared light into an electrical signal. Feeding stations placed at the four corners of the rat's cage take turns emitting infrared signals that guide the rats to them releasing a reward only when the rat presses the button on the feeding station that is emitting the infrared light. So that's the some nifty little test. So that's how you can confirm that you're definitely seeing it. So not only have you got the potential of night vision, you're potentially seeing an infrared as well, getting a bit Geordie the Forge, but it's using your own eyeballs. Geordie, Geordie the Forge being the guy in Star Trek, he had to have the visor so he could see, but he was seeing in you know different frequencies. So yes, but more, oh, there's more, more godlike powers. So, I mean, like I say, this we've seen with this new scientist article, infrared. I mean, and this can potentially be done with humans then. And there's uh, Dr. Charles, was it Charles Morgan, who's a who did a presentation. Yeah, I'll just quickly put his face up actually, so people can see it. Yeah, Charles Morgan, a guy, it looks a bit like Philip Coulson, I think, from uh, the Marvel films. But this this guy it does a presentation for uh, the modern war institute from about 2013 this is it was a uh, dr charles morgan on a uh, psycho neurobiology at war and he had a he had a quote that i liked talking about these topics where he said that anything that you can co-op you can use with anything you can co-op you can use so after training you can learn to understand this new signal that you're receiving so you can have the ability to see through walls or see heartbeats and there's a number of other possibilities too so imagine that imagine how to see people's heartbeats that'd be good for medical stuff or it'd be good for like stealthy stuff stealthy army stuff to see heartbeats or to be able to see through walls or seeing like i say seeing infrared predator vision you know so the ability to add a sixth sense with the ability to control others we'd looked at that as well or be controlled and imagining controlling flying drones is going to be pretty easy at this point but what about so these what about um drones that are non-human what about insects and then we're seeing that in pop culture with ant-man well we could do this now we've got these technologies you know so in years to come these technologies have become more delicate more refined so things like the trans magnetic stimulation device transcranial magnetic stimulators and, and putting caps on your head and holding big donuts above your head those days will be gone soon and they'll be able to activate i like, say specific neurons instead of big clusters like they could like they do now so currently the latest brain to brain communication com is being done without um, penetrating the skull as well but moving on to another godlike power before uh, time catches up with us it, what about another godlike power we've got today what about hades 
and invisibility. Of course, with Hades, the god of the underworld, he possessed a helmet of invisibility. And you can connect this to, obviously, stealth technology, stealth aeroplanes that's used by the military aircraft, okay? And you've got advanced metamaterials and and this and and these materials contribute to radar invisibility as well there was the famous philadelphia experiment where maybe they got um optical invisibility with the uss eldridge which is you know a bit of a conspiracy theory story but we've got that stuff but it's not only stealth tech now we've and we've got uh inv invisibility cloak type stuff for these meta materials so we'll look at this one next and if someone's got the pesky some of them folk with the night vision eye drops, then maybe we can counter it with an invisibility cloak. So let's have a look at this. I found an article here in interestingengineering.com. This is back from uh, February 2021. So an innovation. Invisibility cloaks are no longer just science fiction. If the screen will scroll down. Oh, no, I think it's froze out again. Oh, dear. We're not doing very well, are we? But yeah, with Metam, so okay, so if, with Hades in from the you know ancient Greek mythology stuff, that's another godlike power, invisibility, and we are getting so close. I mean, I've seen. Oh, is it crashed out again? Oh, my internet just keeps going, doesn't it? I don't know what we're going to do then, because my internet's crashed out of this. Then let's uh, let me just keep rolling and just see what happens. I'm that. Okay, I think we're back. I think we're back. Oh, it crashed out again. I don't know. I don't know why it keeps doing that. So, okay, let's have a look at. Let's have a look at this. Right, I'll get to try. <laughs> it's been a nightmare. It's been a nightmare today with these technical glitches and keep freezing out. So let's try and get. All right, then let me try and get. Get this last bit up. Let's try and get, get at least try and get through the show. Right then, let me get myself off the screen. We'll reselect this Windows capture. Da, 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 and we'll have a look at invis invisibility helmet of Hermes. We'll see what we've got with the meta materials and the invisibility cloak. Hope it's still going. Uh, uh, internet just keeps crashing out and just going boop, boop. I'm back. I'm back. Let's just keep going quickly. I ain't got long on the show anyway. So just try and get to the end. Invisibility cloak then. So invisibility cloaks are no longer just science fiction. And this is from February 2021 on interestingengineering.com. So cloaking technology on visibility has been a highly coveted superpower in the realms of science fiction and fantasy and with the ancients. Aliens from distant galaxies, powerful wizards, and the humble hobbits have used the ability to be invisible in some form or another. Well, it looks like we could actually get our hands on an invisibility cloak in the near future. Scientists and private companies are already working on a technology. However, the path to creating a magic, the magic of a cloaking technology is not as straightforward as you think. The technology is far from perfect. In fact, not only is it difficult to create, there are many different ways to make something invisible. So they've got too many ways to do it as well. That's, that's interesting. That's quite fascinating, that is. I didn't think about that. But yes, lots of ways to do it. So, finding the most viable and useful option is tricky. However, do not lose hope. Some research and prototypes out there could actually bring an invisibility cloak to the market sooner than you think. So, that's exciting. Scientists are trying to create the technology that would let you disappear in an instant. A true cloaking device would need to find its way to need a way to bend light around a person or object from all directions. Yet one of these scientists has created a cloaking technology that is rel relatively simple. They've used cameras to record and project images of what's behind an object onto the object's surface, making it appear like it's not there even there. Okay, so it's projecting images to create an illusion. That you're seeing through it okay so in the early 2000s a team of researchers from the university of tokyo created an optical camouflage system that makes anyone wearing the unique reflective materials seem to disappear multiple versions of the technology have appeared since 
with each um, rendition getting more advanced. A similar, albeit fictional, version of the technology was used in Mission Impossible in Ghost Protocol. And there was also, I happen to know, in, in the Ghost in the Shell as well. They had the opt and they called it optical camouflage as well. The caveat, though, however, the key to creating true invisibility cloak may center around the metamaterials, these metal dielectric composites engineered on the nanoscale. The composite structure acts as an array of artificial atoms enabling electromagnetic radiation to pass freely around the object. The metamaterial guides light around the object. It is around the object it, it is coating to create the illusion that the object isn't there. So it's bending, bending it around the person. Got a little image for the video viewers there. It even blocks out the heat, the heat signature. So we're to hide away from um predator if he ever comes. And yeah, so in 2006, a group of researchers from Duke University used metamaterials to create a simplified cloaking device that was able to hide objects from microwaves while it could not hide things from human view, however. It's important, but it's an important first step in creating a real life invisibility cloak. Ten years later, Duke, Duke University researchers developed the seven layer metamaterial cloaking system that could shield a small object from electromagnetic waves all the way from infrared to the radio portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's pretty damn good. So yes, so that's another one in the invisibility cloak. And of course, we'll have a quick look at um, the next one then for another godlike uh, power we've got today, super strength. Hercules, of course, was known for being very strong, he had exceptional strength compared to the, the and but it, that can be compared to exoskeletons have got to their empowered suits they enhance human strength and endurance aiding individuals to perform physically demanding tasks so yeah we've seen exosuits we've seen that sort of thing in in the movies and we think of mechs and stuff but that's kind of art of putting a suit on if that idea of putting a suit on is is not if the idea of wearing a suit doesn't suit you sir then how about if you work back on the biohacking angle and give yourself the Forrest Gump treatment for super endurance. So how about this? We've got the Forrest Gump of mice. They've managed to give mice again. The rats got the infrared, so we'll give mice a little thing. We'll give mice a simple gene that lets rodents run and run and run. And this is back from 2011. This is a kind of old tech. So basically, they've got this. So they've got these, these mice and identified certain genes, minus and insipid edges. I don't know. The internet's froze again. Oh, not again. Don't freeze again. Oh, come on. What are we doing? What's going on here? Okay, let's uh, close this down once again. Are we back? Um, no, it just keeps crashing out. I don't know what's going on with this. Let's try. Oh, is the internet back? I don't know if we're back in the chat. I don't know if we're still streaming, but we'll just assume that we are. Okay, so instead of exoskeletons... Okay, I'm sorry, folks. It just keeps crashing. The internet just keeps crashing. I have to keep trying to put it back up. So, yeah, I'll try and wrap it up then. <laughs> I just said that a minute ago. Try and try and get get through this last one. Okay, so we'll try again. Instead of if exoskeletons aren't your thing, then for super strength flight like Hercules, then how about we give you the Forrest Gump treatment? So we've got these these mice that uh, they've managed to find a gene, a simple gene that lets rodents run and run and run. And this is from um, 2011. So this has been around for a while. So that's something that's going to be coming our way. We can have a gene that lets us have super endurance. So quickly read this on november the 6th streets of all five boroughs of the big apple cordoned off uh, uh, you get the you know the, the new york marathon okay but with these rodents they've managed to they've managed to basically be able to figure a way to make them run faster so the exact mechanism at play is unknown but it's found that dramatic changes in rodents musculature Endurance athletes rely on slow twitch muscles, fibrous bundles, and guzzle oxygen 
and fatigue slowly. Sprinters, however, derive their power from fast twitch fibers that produce intense bursts of energy. These fibers use less oxygen but tire quickly. In mice, engineered without a muscle building gene called IL15R alpha, fast twitch muscles in their front legs acted more like the slow twitch fibers. Despite running for hours every night, the engineered mice showed no exhaustion, whereas unaltered mice, they, they bonked after just half an hour, it says. In humans, variants of the IL-15R alpha gene have been found in world-class endurance competitors, suggesting, that the, suggesting a target for gene therapy aimed at boosting the ability to exercise longer. Quote, it's not unreasonable that athletes would try to improve their performance this way, says Con Conrana, who's doing the research. They are investigating treatments for muscle waste and disease and for obesity, but often receive uh, inquiries from athletes too. Gene doping is technically possible, which is why the World Anti-Doping Agency has preemptively banned the practice amongst the Olympic athletes since 2003. Athletes looking for looking for an edge could uh, theoretically inject DNA swatches into the thighs and hope for the transformation, but not working, not without taking some serious risks. They could the IL fifteen R gene is expressed in tissue over the muscle, so. No one wants. The, no one knows the full consequences of turning these genes off. But Forrest Gump aside, a few people want to be able to run forever. So they're saying it could be dangerous. They're still doing the research. Obviously, it's, it would be a, like a, a doping law situation. You know, it'd be one of them. But anyway, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, I froze, guys. I don't know what happened there. Just the, uh, just the internet just keeps crashing out on me. But anyway, well. We'll, we'll get through the rest of these and we'll see. But yeah, so that's another one then. So there's potentiality for getting our, you know, muscle fibers, the, the long endurance ones and the shorter bursting ones to kind of switch over and give you more endurance. And so maybe some gene editing can help us with things like that in the future. You know, uh, gene optimized. I don't know what you think about that. But that's another potential godlike power because if you could do it for endurance, maybe you could do it for strength too. So, because then at least if you've got, if you're not running out, if you're not getting tired, at least you go to the gym for longer and then you get stronger, won't you? That'll come with it. So then you'll get your strength. So maybe that's part of why some of these, even if Hercules weren't real, you still have really strong people in, you know, throughout history, you know, records that haven't been broken for a while and stuff. And we've got that really strong guy that we call Thor, world's strongest man competitor guy. So there are some real beasts out there. But anyway, what about one last power then? So I've had the, I've had the, the power of, um, obviously we talked a bit about the power of flight and the healing and stuff we can interface with the brain and the nervous system and the biohacking, night vision, eye drops, using CE6, in, um, invisibility cloaks, and some of the metamaterials are getting advanced now. I've obviously got exoskeletons for the super strength. But then, it, but... And we've looked at the Forrest Gump treatment as well. We can get super endurance. But of course, any self-respecting God would be able to culture biology and create unique life and turn it into something viable. So if you want to play God, you've got to check Craig's list. Craig Venter, that is. So you've got Dr. Craig Venter, his artificial life from yeast. This is this is a bit of an unusual one. So you want to, you want to play God? Playing God, the man who would create artificial life. And this is from 2008. So this is, a, this is a, it's getting on now, you know, 15 decade and a half ago now. So um, got to wonder where these things are going. Has this guy created artificial life? Okay, so God's creating life. The possibility of synthetic life form has been created in a laboratory, has been come tantalizingly close to reality after scientists said last night in 2011 that they had generated the largest man-made molecule of DNA, the chemical blueprint for life. For the first time, researchers led by the conventional American scientific entrepreneur Craig Venter has manufactured the entire DNA genome of free living organ microorganisms. 
This means that artificial life is on the verge of being created in a test tube. The huge DNA molecule represents the chromosome that makes up the complete genome of a mysoplasm genitalium, a parasitic microbe that lives in, in the re reproductive tract. Dr. Venter and his colleagues made the chromosome by placing each of its 582,970 individual chemical units into the correct genetic sequence. Their achievement was the final step necessary before scientists attempt the ultimate goal of inserting the synthetic genome into an empty shell of a non-living cell to see if it can create a fully replicating man-made organism. Dr. Venter said the aim of the research was to make new artificial life forms that can help to solve the world's most pressing environmental problems, for instance, by producing green biofuels, breaking down toxic waste, or even absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. He emphasized that the new microbes created by the process were made incapable of infecting other organisms, especially humans, and that they would not be able to survive beyond the confines of the laboratory because of a self-destruct mechanism built into the DNA. Dr. Venter compared the achievement to the creation of a software program for an operating system for a computer. The next step would be to put the operating system into a computer hardware of an empty cell and see what could be booted up. We want to emphasize that we have not yet booted up any synthetic chromosomes. There are some problems to be overcome, but we are confident that we'll, we will be able to do so. And I'd be surprised if we couldn't do it in 2008. The work published in the journal Science was carried out by J. Craig Venter Institute in Rockville, Maryland, by a team who included Hamilton Smith, who won a share of the 1978 Nobel Prize for his discovery of ways to cut DNA into fragments using chemicals called restriction enzymes. So that's creating artificial life. And that any self-respecting God's going to want to be able to do that. But again, as Dr. Charles Morgan uh, said in 2013, you can engineer a unique thing. So can, so I'm saying consider this other part of the sentence. You can engineer a unique thing that will kill only one person in the world. And we're not, and it, this is going beyond, you know, race or person specific viruses, you know, and, and he's, he's talking at it from a military perspective because it was military talk. But you have to wonder if you're creating artificial life from, from yeast, basically, then how far does this go? Because I wonder about, are, they, are we, have we but perhaps, Perhaps this is further along than we think, than this is talking, saying, well, how far does it go? And have we been able to create an organism then? And how big is it? And then oh, I'm harking back to the, there's decades old rumors that we have already know how to create humanoids called PLS, programmable life forms. You can make, and there's been, de de for the, at least 20 years, been talking about that in Britain. There's been rumors about uh, being in, in Latin, uh, secure facilities in the south like around peasemore the, in britain high secure facility or port and down so these plfs i don't know have we got kind of programmable life forms then that are like humanoid a bit like ets because we've but then because we're here you know have we, have we got these large life forms we've got humanoid life forms because if we don't have them though and it's starting to look impossible that we're going well we're going to be doing it soon in the future well, it's okay to talk about UFOs now, and you, and you hear about these UFO encounters where they talk of the abductees, so-called alien encounters, they sense these aliens as being somehow artificial despite being organic, you know, like biological computer things. So, like I say, we know we're starting to talk about UFOs now. It's okay to do that. So you've got, if we ain't got them, do ETs have, do aliens have these programmable life forms being used like drones or program to do stuff you know and then there's a this gene splicing as well which was it was a you know is, an, is another thing that that we can do you know another, another article here we've got and we've got dreads as well designer receptors activated only by designer drugs so you've got these special designer receptors where you can activate them with certain chemicals that your your proprietary stuff you know 
you've like got the chemical key to unlock something. So let's have a quick read about this. This is from uh, News Medical Net, News Medical Life Sciences. So dreads, what do you want to look like us with this god? Get yourself some dreads. Designer receptor site activated only by designer drugs. Belong to a class of proteins called uh, chemogenetic proteins. Sorry, chemogenetic proteins. These engineered proteins allow scientists to control nerve cell activity. And so how do they work? Dreads allow G protein coupled receptors to produce a synthetic uh, ligands and not the natural ligands okay and they are activated by a molecule called clozapine n oxide or cno which is biologically inert g proteins are important for cell signaling molecules and researchers can investigate cell function in living organisms by modulating this signaling in time and space the greatest use of dreads is in neuroscience because cno can easily cross the blood brain barrier. Oh, okay. Various dreads coupled to different G protein receptor types, such as G1, sorry, GI, GS, and GQ. Any of these can be selected depending on the cellular pathway to be activated or inactivated. These proteins are typically used to study nerve pathways, diabetes, metabolic disorder, uh, metabolic disorders. Parkinson's disease, alcohol abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, to regulate behaviors in mice reacting to drugs and drug addictions. What are the properties of dreads? Dreads are mutant mu muscarinic receptors that are screened for the following characteristics. They've got low constitutive activity, high ligand affinity, and uh, highly specific to specific ligands. So how do they act? The proteins are manipulated to react specifically with small molecules and act as chemical actuators, but which are not previously recognized as, by, as proteins. A viral vector insert the gene and in, encodes the engineered mutant G protein coupled receptor protein into the cell to be studied. Various, promoter, various promoters help select the target cells. The infected cells take two to three weeks to express the engineered receptor protein that is activated. So you get different types and they've got all this gene spice. You can edit your genes. And of course we've got um, CRISPR as well. Is it CRISPR? We've got the CRISPR, which is um, for gene editing, which stands for clustered regulatory interspaced short polyvomic repeats, which are a hallmark of bacterial defense that forms the basis of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology. In the field of genome engineering, the term CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9 is often used loosely to refer to various CRISPR and uh, CPF1 and other systems that can be used to program and target specific stretches of a gene code and edit DNA at precise locations, as well as for other purposes, such as for new diagnostics tools. With these systems, researchers can permanently modify genes in living cells and organisms in the future. It may make it possible to correct mutations at precise locations in the human genome in order to treat genetic, uh, genetic causes of disease. Other systems are now available, such as CRISPR-Cas13, that target RNA, provide alternate value, uh, it provides alternate avenues for uses such as unique because of its unique characteristics being leveraged from sensitive diagnostic tools such as Sherlock. So how did it work? I mean, well, I mean, I mean, the starting to, I know they're starting to figure this stuff out now, so we can, but I want to make the point here just before we finish up that we, we can do this gene editing stuff. So I think we've got PLS. I think we can make life like God like the gods sort of thing so you know like i said at the beginning we did the power of flight one with uh, looking at icarus and and say drones are like child's play for us now vertical takeoff crafts are coming for us and we know that's just small fry really because it's ufos and then obviously not using diesel we've got patrick Flanagan in the neurophone we're getting a kind of telepathy starting to come on using technologies and that's even that's 
if you don't believe that we've got an organic telepathy that we can develop ourselves anyway. So we've got that Hermes power already probably built in as two. We've got the healing powers. We've got the the that Apollo had in ancient Greek mythology. And DARPA's now got these little light, tiny little nanobots, it sounds like, and that can find the way to the brain to help con people control prosthetic limbs. Or you can have additional limbs, maybe, you know, in suits and stuff. And then using implants for mental health and plug it into your nervous system. And then you've got the biohacking that we talked about and um, thing, the night vision. You can have your own eyeballs with just some C6 eye drops. So, so you know, we've got the the night vision going on invisibility cloaks and the meta materials are really coming on super strength we've got the super endurance with the forest gump effect with certain genes and making the fibers switch over the controls you know and now craig venter with this artificial life maybe created from yeast and we know we've got all these gene editing and gene splicing opportunities and dreads so and there's a another technique called stereo stenography as well which is an intriguing field um where this professor David Walt has made notable contributions. Uh, and this is uh, to do with encoding DNA. So, you, so even as a God, you can make your little life forms and then you can put your important information stored inside the life forms, very DNA, because one gram of DNA, it turns out can hold 700 terabytes of information. So one gram, let me say one gram of DNA can hold the same information as 7 billion iPads, 700 terabytes, 7 billion iPads in one gram of DNA. So that's an amazing storage system for your secret godly stuff or stuff you want to say. Great military applications there, storing stuff inside DNA. And then that you wouldn't get picked up on any scanners, would you? You're not carrying anything. You've got nothing on you. Maybe you've got a bit of a molecule, a bit of your DNA. And then that's it. You can get decode the message at the other end. Crazy, crazy stuff, man. We're living in the future. Got some really, really wild, wild technologies going on. Godlike powers. So, so I thought I'd present this today. I thought it'd be a fun one to do. So, godlike powers available now. So, I hope you enjoyed the show. Yes, the replicants in Blade Runner. That's what I think. Like the PLFs are sort of a bit like the replicants in Blade Runner. It's a good call. That I like that. Yeah, Frankenstein's monster. But I don't think it'll be a monster. It's going to be like its own. Th it's not going to be made out of other parts, is it? It'll be made of its own parts. So maybe something much more refined. Maybe Frankenstein will be sitting with you, you know, having a riveting conversation at, at dinner time with you and stuff, you know, in his suit and looking nice. Maybe a bit less grotesque. <laughs> more happy. But anyway, yes. Anyway, yeah, I just wanted to get a stream out today. Make sure I don't get out of practice and uh, fighting the technical problems. But, you know, and sometimes when you get problems, you just want to beat it, don't you, and get through. So, well, thanks for bearing with me for the couple of crashes that we had. Thanks for listening, Daryl, Eriko. I don't know if um, uh, Dark Devious is still there. Uh, I know Algorithm did dip in at one point. But love you guys. Really appreciate the support. It really helps. really helps fuel the show. And um, we're going to wrap it up now. And hopefully, uh, I'll delete some stuff off my hard drive. And hopefully, I won't have so many uh, internet crashy problems in the future. But for now, we'll play some music. We'll say goodbye. And uh, hopefully, get another show out tomorrow if we don't have any more technical problems. But anyway, we'll just fade out with a little bit of music. Welcome. Thank you very much, everybody. You take care of yourselves. And I'll see you all tomorrow night. God willing. You will take care of yourselves and I'll and see you later. In our quest to uncover the unknown.